Now, you and I have two very different points of view. And the reason that, that I consider you an arch nemesis is that I think your theory um, based on E8, which is depicted in this crystal block for those who are viewing on YouTube. Thanks for bringing your kryptonite to the show. <laughs> um, your approach to this is to say, let's start out with some object that is mathematically distinguished and very peculiar, effectively right. like a platypus of the mathematical world. And let's try to distill from this thing that has to exist for reasons of logical necessity and is ex maybe the most complicated naturally occurring object, um, arguably, that you could pick. And let's find the richness of our natural world as distilled from this bizarre um, freakish occurrence in the laws of mathematical necessity. Is that a fair telling? Um, from a top-down perspective, it is. But the way I got there is by describing spinners and seeing that spinners is part of this one beautiful mathematical object, naturally. And it's, it's unique to the exceptional Lie groups, to, to, to these, this class, this small class of objects. And when you say exceptional Lie groups, what you mean is Platypi. continuous symmetries that only occur once, that they don't fall into some regular pattern. Right. Okay. And, uh, and spinners are naturally a part of their geometry. And they're, and they're, and they're, they're intricate, beautiful objects. They have spinners naturally as part of their geometry. And that if you dissect them, you can see all the other parts necessary to particle physics and gravity. And this was just stunning to me. And at this point, I'm like, all right, I've, I've built up from the ground up, from, from particle physics and from gravity and from spinners, I've built this structure up and see how it's all interconnected. And I found that they're all part of this small class of mathematical objects that are, that are unique in their intricacy and beauty um, for finite dimensional objects. And that's why now I appear to have adopted more of a top-down view where it seems like, oh, I started with this pretty object and I said, oh, look, it explains everything, but it's, it's nowhere near like that, how I actually got to there, all right? The, the truth is I'm building up. And the truth is the next object is gonna be higher dimensional objects that include uh, E8 like this one as a, as a subgroup. So the way I'm hearing you, Garrett, and again, you know, this is like one of the most obscure- <laughs> This is gonna lose some of your listeners, but I, well, I, it's gonna, I'm, I'm happy to talk about well, it. Well, but so. I'm trying to, we're trying to describe this. I would like to describe this a little bit as, as if we were taking somebody to an opera in a foreign language so that they can follow the plot even though they can't follow line by line, okay? The way I see what you're saying is, is that there is a usual kind of symmetry, which we would associate with bosons, that is the force particles of the universe. And what makes these very strange objects that you've, you've referred to as in, in referring to exceptional Lie groups, is that you appear to take something from the fermionic universe, that is the sp spinorial universe, where the spinners come from, and you adjoin it in some sense to the bosonic to get more symmetries. Yes. Yeah, that's very clear. Okay. There's a huge problem with the strategy. Well, wait, but this, but you're forgetting the part where this structure exists as part of these exceptional objects. Well, no, no, I'm not. You've correctly described how these objects occur in nature, that right. there is some regular kind of typical symmetry, a bosonic symmetry, then you, you take some of these spinners that are re related to that symmetry and you fuse them together to get an even more beautiful, weird, symmetric object. But the problem with that strategy mm -hmm. is, is that we know that nature has these two very different recipes for how she wants to treat these things quantum mechanically. Right. One of them goes under the name of bosonic quanti uh, quantization, and the other sort of goes under the name sometimes of, of you know, Berezin theory. Or, right. And anti commuting numbers. Num numbers were A times B equals negative B times A. Completely parallel, totally different treatment. And the way you've done it, you've really taken the fermions, that is the matter part, the, the spinners that we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. 
you've lumped them together with the bosons. And now they're fused in a way that it's going to be almost impossible to treat the spinners in a manner befitting fermionic quantization. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very straightforward, though. The, the fermions just end up being along directions orthogonal to space-time. I don't see that that actually works. I mean, this is, this is my great, my, my criticisms of your theory, which we've known each other now for 11 years, and this is the basis of our antagonism, is that on the one hand, um, you ingeniously saw, and I give you your credit, that E8, the largest of these objects, a 248 dimensional behemoth, carried some numerology surrounding three copies of the spinners that are present, which looked in some sense, could be confused for, may be related to three copies of matter. <laughs> it was about that hand wavy, yeah. Okay. So all the honor to you. That's not an obvious feature. Most people who barely know what the exceptional E groups are, most of them don't know that it has to do with this property called triality. Okay. That was, that was true. But there really wasn't, in my opinion, enough room to pack the particles that we currently see into this group structure mm -hmm. um, with three generations. That was one issue. Second of all, because the, of, the, of the particular way in which bosons and fermions, matter and force, were fused together, it really pushed everything towards the bosonic side, that is the force side of the equation. So you're going to now have to be in some kind of technical debt where you would have to figure out how to get the fermions back into a matter framework because you would actually push them too far through unification into a, a union with force. That was another basic concern. Mm -hmm. And um, my last concern was that because of the properties of this object, you didn't have any room for what we call chirality, in which the universe um, that we've seen so far appears to have a left-right asymmetry to it. It's as if it has a beauty mark. And these, um, the any object that you derive from E8 is gonna be very hard to get it to have a beauty mark because E8 doesn't have a beauty mark itself. So these were, three things that you are going to have to pay back right uh if you were going to connect this to to the world that we see and i my yeah, no, irritation with you was is that i yeah. brought this up with you in 2000 and you remind me 2008 not 2009 right. when we met at the perimeter institute yeah. and i tried to warn you about these things i felt like you never took me seriously no i did take you seriously i've taken all these problems seriously and uh they're discussed in subsequent work and uh the way I've been resolving them is by tackling a, a larger unspoken problem, which is how to have a quantum description of this sort of geometry, All right? Because our universe is a, a quantum universe and E8 is a finite dimensional object and you have to have multiple states, multiple numbers of particles be able to occupy every state. So if you have a, a, a full quantum description of a theory, you need an infinite dimensional geometry to do it. Well, I, I always thought your your goal was to take a finite object and then take waves on that finite object to create something that was going to be infinite dimensional. I didn't see right. that as that's, being its but, problem. But that's not good enough. Yeah. Say more. Because just 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 when you talk about waves on a geometric object, those act as different representations mathematically because of the Peter Weil theorem. But when you uh, when you do that, that's not enough to give you all the structure you need for quantum field theory. You really need an, a fundamentally infinite dimensional geometric object to describe quantum field theory. And, and, this, and, and by looking at what sort of objects you need that include exceptional Lie groups, but are infinite dimensional geometries that can correspond to quantum field theory, that's how you tackle the three problems you discussed. You, you, get, you, have, you can have more space to handle the three generations of particles. You can have uh, the uh, anti-commuting fermions in them so that, that they behave like fermions should, like matter particles should. And it's also, you know, large enough to give you the sort of dynamics you need for quantum field theory. So that's why I've, I've, I've in the intervening 10 years since we've had a deep discussion about this, 
I've now started looking at generalized infinite dimensional geometries, which are, are gener infinite dimensional generalizations of Lie groups, which, which solve these problems. And that's, that's why I've been You working. really believe that you've solved these problems? I think I have a really good description that goes a long way Garrett, towards these things. Here's the thing. If I just think about where we are with the standard model, right? you've got four dimensions of space and time, right? Then you've got an extra eight dimensions uh, coming from something called SU3, three dimensions from something called SU2, and one extra dimension coming from something called U1. Mm -hmm. That's the basic data right? Um, that occurs. And, and, and gravity, people leave out gravity. You, you could put in six dimensions for something called spin three one, yeah. okay? But the point is I can add those all up and I'm gonna get some, some number probably, you know, in 20s of dimen 20 some odd dimensions, whatever. That finite thing mm -hmm. generates the infinite dimensional world of quantum field theory. Well, wait a minute, but quantum field theory, there, we have a way of mapping between those ba the base geometry and then going to quantum field theory, right? And then you have Fox space, right? And you have occupation numbers for all the different possible states. Garrett, my point is you're working on a problem that has certain foreseeable problems as part of the challenge. And unlike your detractors from the more standard community, um, I'm not I'm not telling you that you're dead on arrival just because certain problems can be seen. That would be unfair. Right. And then by the way, that's what, you know, there are lots of problems that can be seen from the string theory community where let's say, you know, the, the number of dimensions it wants to play in is doesn't seem to be the right number or that they thought there were only a finite number of theories. It turns out that there's a continuum of theories, or, et cetera. Or the vast majority come out with. Right. And, and, and I get very system. irritated that somehow the string theory community uh, is entitled to make all these mistakes and anybody outside, if they say one wrong thing or one seemingly wrong thing, they're excommunicated. It's a ridiculous standard. That's not what I'm trying to do to you. I'm trying to say something very different, which is you're going to be up against the fact that if your initial data comes from this most beautiful and most bizarre of all objects, E8, right. and it as doesn't I, contain- As I said, I'm now working on its generalizations to infinite dimensions. But there's an it, issue of intellectual check kiting. Like, I don't mind the idea that you recognize the debts that you're in, mm -hmm. and then you say, I think I have a way of getting this thing to close off. Right. But there is a question of, well, now that you've recognized, am I right? I mean, am I right? No, you're that absolutely the, right. Am I, I right I, that the issues that I raised with you initially turned out to be really serious problems? Of course. I mean, and most of those- But you didn't those, know that back then. Yeah, they, I did. They were, they were in the paper. They were in the original paper saying that the, the description of three generations was very hand wavy and unsatisfactory. That's in the original paper. Okay. My recollection was that when I tried to explain to you why people were going to have the objection about the two different quantization schemes, that that was not handled correctly. Right. Well, I handled that in a paper in 2010 or so. Okay. So that was group cosmology. All right. That was one of the, the issues. Yep. Then there was going to be an issue that you weren't able to bring the left, right asymmetry out of the initial data. There wasn't enough. Right. And that was a fair description. Absolutely. Okay. And then you're saying that the, um, I ceded to you that you were making a connection between the mysterious appearance of three copies of matter uh, and something called triality, which was right. not manifest obviously inside of E8, but to the few people who actually care about this structure, it it, it definitely is there in a very profound way. Yeah, it, it, it relates to rotations in eight dimensional spaces. Yes. But you also haven't taken an interest in what is E8 if not the uh, the wellspring for the source code of the universe. Like, if it isn't the universe, I think it's a piece of it. But I, I'm not religious, Eric. I mean, I'm I'm going to explore whatever seems most promising to explore. Okay. And, well, do you, have you changed your your sense of the status of E8 as a candidate for the unified theory in the fashion that you were originally seeing? It? Absolutely. You have changed your your view. Yes. Can you talk about that? Right. Um, so it was in tackling quantum field theory 
and how to describe it geometrically, which as far as I know, nobody has done. I mean, whenever, whenever you have, you, you start with, as you say, U1, SU2, SU3, and, and you go through this quantization procedure for its field. So you get a quantum yeah. field theory. Or if you're dealing with strings, Right. right, you have this model of, of vibrating strings in higher dimensions. Then you go through this quantization procedure to get a quantum quantum theory of strings. Okay, right. We have we physicists have this toolkit for quantizing things, but that's utterly the wrong way to look at reality. If if the universe is just one thing, which it is, then it's one mathematical object. I mean, you're making a point that is very well understood, I believe in the right. standard theoretical so, physics community, which is that if the world starts off as quantum, right. you should talk about classicalizing pieces of it rather exactly than right. quantizing the classical pieces that appear to exist. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so what's a quantum geometric object look like? It's an, you know, with, with all these infinite dimensional Fox space and the creation and annihilation of, of elementary particles people, possible. People at home won't know what a Fox space is. A right. Fox space is effectively where the states of the system can live when you have multiple particles in a situation and you can change the number of particles that you have just the way a photon can break into an electron and a, a positron pair. Um, that would be possible in a Fox space, not possible in a simpler quantum system. That's right. So effectively a Fox space is just a large place to play where the number of particles in the system can change up to infinity. Keep going. So in order to describe this as one geometric object, you're stuck with a generalized Lie group, infinite dimensional generalized Lie group. Y yes. And in order to describe spinners, it's going to be an exceptional generalized Lie group. Garrett, I don't think, I don't think you're adding anything. I think that the problem here is, is that E8 um, is an exceptionally beautiful, exceptionally interesting object. It did have the properties that you were talking about in that it unifies um, standard symmetries with these spinners right. to form new symmetries. That's right, but it's but it inadequate. Does, what? It's, it's inadequate. not only inadequate, it, it would push them into a universe of pure force rather than a universe divided between force and matter. You're actually, the problem is, is that the kind of unification it would create would be completely force unification with with an absence of matter. You'd be dragging matter, if you will, spinners. Yeah, you're, you're, you're focusing on a problem that 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 was, uh, you know, that was solved in a paper in 2010. But it, it, it's very simply that fermions are orthogonal to space time, whereas uh, you know the force fields, the boson fields, are along space time. But the same way the the same way if you have two force fields that are along space time but in different directions. They would anti-commute, right? So what you're doing is you're using space-time, if you will, which is, a, again, a kind of a classical Einsteinian concept, right. to break apart a unified system, which was the intention in unification to begin with, right. and then you're going to try to treat these two things naturally uh, according to two totally different prescriptions. That's right. that You're violating... I mean, in some sense, any kind of naturality that you just picked up in the unification to begin with. Um, in a sense, yeah, but the symmetry has to break somehow. Does it do it in a natural? I mean, this doesn't feel, this feels yeah, like probably a Probably not. It, it allows it. It doesn't seem completely natural, but it, it does allow it. Well, but the whole point of the thing, I thought, was to take the naturality and what we had understood about the nature of these exceptional objects mm -hmm. and to say, hey, these things actually unify beautifully inside uh, of these very unusual, elegant mathematical structures. They do, but it was, it was too small. As you said, it was too small because it didn't correctly contain three generations of, of matter and because it can't correctly portray quantum field theory. But once you go to the to larger generalized Lie groups, it can't. Well, you know, if this was a startup, what you're saying is, is that the business is going great, but it's just run out of money and I need a fresh infusion of cash. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. This is, no, this no, is no, sounding no, like no. an intellectual check kiting. No, no, it's, 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 it's round B funding. <laughs> Series B. <laughs> I see. Um, are, is it cash flow positive? <laughs> not yet. I haven't even put the paper out yet. Okay. 
so the, there's, I mean, I, I look, it's not a question that I, I need to see the paper or that you're not allowed to take out more loans, but are you getting more? I mean, I know you to be, look, I've, I, I hate to say this, but I have defended you to the regular community. Uh, with some frequency, because I have viewed you as an honest broker for your own stuff. I don't think you're trying to get away with something. I think Thank you. what you try, what you're trying to do, is you're trying to say I need to take some advances, which I think and I hope I can pay back, which I think is an admirable and honorable way to do physics. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about your own theory? Are you worried that you're going to infinite dimensions in the way that you've? been forced to modify on several previous occasions and that in fact this is not going to close i am unusually confident that i'm on the right track with this one really yeah Oy. There, there are too many things matching up in the right way this doesn't sound good garrett i gotta I be know. honest with you <laughs> um but see I, I i will put a paper out yeah yeah okay and uh you know people may not find it interesting or they might find it really interesting. Well, I wish you the best of luck, but <laughs> I, I have to tell you that I do think that the problems in this program, I mean, again, I, I, I should just be honest about it. I thought that the choice of E8 was so natural that they're really one of two choices that I can see as being the way to go if you're going to avoid the, the usual um, paths in in research into into fundamental physics one is that you f start with the most beautiful intricate object you can find and then you find the intricacies of the natural world somehow living uh inside of the intricacies which occurred right. naturally that's that the, would be the, that's e the top down view and it's, right. and it's quite nice to look at it that way the bottom up view is that somehow you start with something that's practically lifeless which i've analogized to a fertilized egg and somehow it bootstraps itself into this weird, intricate, um, and Baroque world that we find ourselves in. And it sort of auto, the universe auto catalyzes from almost nothing. And these are the two basic approaches that I can imagine that would not strain the concept of a theory of everything. Right. Well, then we, we both engage in both of these. But once you've used this bottom up approach, Right. Starting with your fertilized egg and, and getting up into more and more complexity. Then you start to see a complete object after you've expanded it out. Sorry, you view yourself as exploring the concept of... Going from the bottom up. What is it that you've done that, that has that character? Um, starting from gravity and particle physics. And how they can be matched up together in a... In a in a way that brings Neither spinners the, about natural. Okay, that's that's not very simple at all. Well, I know gravity. But, gravity is already you know you're, you're talking about the curvature of a space time manifold. Oh, it's beautiful stuff though. I love it. No, it's absolutely gorgeous. I don't think we're we're divided by that. But when it comes to um, you know breaking up this object called the curvature tensor into three different pieces, throwing one of the one of them away called the vial curvature and then fine tuning the other two to be equal to the matter uh, and energy in the universe. There's a lot of stuff that's going into that story that isn't, I mean, that's an intricate story. And then the other yeah. story is even worse and right. weirder. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're smuggling in a ton of complexity. When I say fertilized egg, um, I'm thinking at the level of cytology but you know, at the level of the actual DNA, that's incredibly rich. So when when I you know maybe it's a bad analogy because it's not bootstrapping itself out of nothing. Right. You're smuggling in a ton of intricacy. But you have to look in both directions. You have to look from the bottom up, and then once you can see the larger picture, then you have to look again from the top down. And if going that way from the top down doesn't match up very well with with what you did to get there then you have to go further and see if you can get a different, bigger picture. It's the only way forward. It, Garrett, but I, I mean, to be honest, I, I feel like, you know, this is, something has run into a wall and there's the sense that, like, how could this beautiful structure not be, not be right? 
it doesn't feel to me like it's insufficient. Yeah. Yeah. And there, but there, there's, there are larger structures that are not finite dimensional, but they're still Lie groups and exceptional Lie groups. They're just generalized infinite dimensional Lie groups that contain E8 as a substructure. 